Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Roger Reynolds. I am a professor here at CSN. Um, you might be your lecturer, but um, I'm here to demonstrate our eugenol experiment today. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to put out a little personal note about today's experiment. We'd like to dedicate this to um, Fred Jackson, who is a professor here in biology who passed away this week. Um, he was the biology chair for a long time, um, well-respected, well-liked by um, everybody here at CSN. And a shout out to um, his wife, Tanya, who was also um, a CSN employee here. They retired a while back. Um, and uh, we're all saddened by Fred's passing. Um, and we just want to know that our thoughts are, are with you, Tanya, and your family, and um, all the best as you try and get through uh, this difficult time. So we're talking about eugenol. And so eugenol is an essential oil. You've seen these in aromatherapy and whatnot. And one thing you might notice is how expensive they are. And so this will give you an idea of why are they so expensive? Well, we're going to be getting this from cloves. So in addition to buying the cloves, once you go through this whole process, which is going to in, uh, involve distillation, and then we have to extract the, um, the eugenol uh, oil from the water, um, and then isolate that. And so you'll see, and we're going to get a small amount for a large amount of cloves that we put in. So that you'll see and then the, the energy we put in to heat all this up, and you can imagine on an industrial scale why these essential oils are so expensive. So um, let's look at the structure of eugenol here. So um, it has an aromatic ring in it. Okay, that's one of the components, one of our functional groups. So we'll put that on. Now, one of the, there's three functional groups in this. One of them is a phenol. So remember, that's a hydroxyl group, which is not a functional group. It's part of many functional groups, phenols. Remember, it's also an alcohol, carboxylic acid, um, and there's acetals, other ones. So here, if we put a hydrogen on here, we'd have another phenol, but we're gonna put an R group, which I could leave it like that, right? That constitutes a methyl group. We can go ahead and put in our ME, put a CH3, however you want. So that functional group is an ether. And then let's make sure we get this on the right. We position here, and we have Anybody remember what that's called? That's called an owl group. So we have a CH2 and then a, a double bond here. So we have an alkene, we have phenol, which really constitutes this whole part, and then we have an ether. And so when we get to isolating this, so we're gonna have two techniques used today. We're gonna be doing distillation, and then we're gonna be using the technique of um, separation through extraction. So when we taught um, distillation before, we did the short path, and then we did the, uh, the, the other longer, what's the name? Fractional. Fractional distillation with the pack column. And when we did the pack column, because we wanted to get more theoretical plates in there so we could separate two compounds. Now this right here, like dissolves like, what do you think? Is this thing polar or nonpolar? What do you think? Is this gonna dissolve in water or not? Now this here is gonna help for its water solubility, but the rest of this molecule is, is all hydrocarbon, nonpolar, and it really dominates this, the solubility. So this compound isn't very soluble in water, and it's also, compared to water, we know water H2O, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This thing doesn't boil, I don't know what the boiling point is actually, but it's gonna be a lot higher than that. 255. 255 degrees. So if we wanted to separate these, we could. We could do a fractional distillation, and we could separate this mixture of cloves and water and get pure water out. But that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is co-distill these. So when the water's coming over at 100, it'll have some of this mixed in. So if you ever notice like your stove, and around your stove, all of a sudden you're cooking, and you see all this oil kind of building up. That's really steam distillation. So you're cooking, you're frying something, and there's water getting uh, boiled out of whatever you're frying and it's carrying the oil with it and eventually you see this oil coating everything that's steam distillation that you're seeing in your own home so along those lines so we don't really want to have a lot of theoretical plates so we're going to go with the short path distillation we want it as short as possible so if you look at the apparatus today it's going right up into the condenser and so we can get these to co-distill together 
Okay, so once their coat is still over, then we have to have this water oil mixture and we're gonna use extraction um, with a polar water and we're gonna use a non-polar solvent to extract out this compound from the water. Then we gotta remove the solvent after we dry it, remove the solvent and then we'll weigh it and hopefully and we'll calculate our yield, which is gonna be very small but this is essential oil. We don't need a whole lot to go around. Now I invite you, if you have some cloves at home, you should go into your pantry, get them out while you're doing, watching this video and smell those cloves because that's what this whole lab smells like once we get going. So you get the true lab experience that way <laughs> in the olfactory regions. Okay, so now once we get this isolated, we're gonna do a couple chemical tests to kind of verify its structure. It's not, it's not absolute proof, but it confirms the structure. So we haven't gotten into a lot of synthesis yet in the, in the course, but we're gonna introduce you to a couple of um, uh, tests that we can do. One of them is a very common um, synthesis technique here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add bromine to this. And bromine can react with double bonds, and it'll add across the double bond. So now when you do synthesis, it's only going to react with this. The rest of this we can call R. I'll go ahead and write it out. If I have room here. I'm going to make it a little smaller so we can see it. So I always, I always like to just write out what's not changing. This is not being affected here. What's being affected is over here. And we're just going to add a bromine on one and then the other carbon. One, two carbons here. That stays the same. So then these two carbons, which were the double bond, they're gonna end up with a bromine here and another bromine here. So we've brominated this. This doesn't need a, cal a, um, a catalyst. It just happens. Um, I don't know if you watch, like orange soda has brominated vegetable oil on it. <laughs> I think they're just phasing that out. For some reason, I think it's a mouthfeel. And so what's nice about it, instead of hydrogenating the vegetable oil, which needs a catalyst and heat, you can just drop bromine in here and you get rid of that saturation. Now it's, we got bromine on here. So what the chemical test is gonna be, so we can visualize what's gonna happen here, is this is gonna be a clear liquid or yellowish oil probably. And this right here is a red color, bromine. Red brown maybe. And then once it gets over to here, it's gonna eliminate this red. So if we have a double bond, we're going to see this color disappear. And I don't want to say colorless. Uh, I'll put that in brackets. It's going to be whatever color this is. It should be pure. I don't know. If, does it have a yellow tint to it, I would think? Yeah, it's yellow tint. Yeah, usually it has yellow tint. We could maybe use some, uh, I don't know if that's the natural color of this or some of the impurities that are going to be left over or other compounds from the uh, clove oil. Because once we get the clove oil itself, it's probably about 85% um, eugenol, and then it's got other compounds in it. And it's all a natural product, so it's not with people are selling this. They don't, you know, they can call it clove oil instead of eugenol, and they'll be safe. So whatever this color is, it'll kind of go over here. The main thing is, is that this red bromine color will disappear. So we can take the bromine and add it to it and we see the bromine disappear. That's showing us that we have a double bond in here. Now another test that we're going to use today too is if we add iron 3 chloride, it complexes with phenols here. And so, and the color of this complex is purple, so it makes a now we can speculate what this is. Amazingly enough, this reaction has been along, around for a long time, almost 100 years, and we still don't know exactly what this iron complex is. So it's, it's a phenol, all phenols tend to do this with iron, and it makes us, we can speculate what it is. But the main thing is when we put this in, this is kind of a yellow solution when we add it in here with a phenol, it's gonna make a purple complex. So that'll give us some indication, some uh, verification that this does indeed have a phenol in it. So those will be the chemical tests that we run to verify what we have. So let's go get to work and let's set up our apparati and our apparatuses out here in the labs for everybody. And we can start distilling over, isolating our eugenol 
from the cloves, and then we'll have to do the extraction to get it away from the water. Okay, so let's get to work. So we're gonna weigh out 10 grams, and when it says 10 grams for something like this, it doesn't have to be perfectly 10 grams. So we're using a weighing boat instead of weighing paper for this because there's such a, a large quantity and it'll help with our transfer eventually. So we're gonna weigh by difference this time. You can just tear this out, but we're gonna go ahead and by difference. So when that settles down, we're gonna get a recording of what the weighing boat is. So this would be something you would be writing in your lab book. And if it's floating on that last digit, you know, it's probably, it may not settle down. There could be some evaporation going on because I just touched it with my hands and got some liquid from my hands, some water. So we'll call it right there. Let's call it there. 160, just put a six zero and let's go on and we'll be here all day. So I want to get about 15 point and a half. 15 and a half is what I'm shooting for. This is well over 10 grams. So I'm going to put this in until we get about 15 and a half. That's not enough. Okay, it's gonna be a lot. So if you have any cloves at home, well this is way uh, over by a gram, not too big a deal, we'll just take some out. Still over by about a gram. I got an injury on my hand here, so I'm a little handicapped. So we're at about 10.4. Okay, let's go with that. So again, whenever you're weighing, you wanna make sure you're closing this so it can settle down. We just got these new scales and they have this extra digits over there into the tenth of a milligram and that's good oh this is settling down right nicely so let's use that as our second so you can get the weight by difference so this is a little over 10 grams once you do the arithmetic so now the tricky part here is getting that into here without spilling it now um, we should probably go over to the hood and do it because we don't want to mess up the balance area now if I had spilled anything here I would clean it up because somebody else is going to use it and it's not their responsibility to clean it up. So I see everything here looks pretty good. So let's go over to the hood and we can make our transfer over there. All right. So here we go. We're going to take um, this and put it in here. This is called a quantitative transfer. So we're trying to do it as without spilling anything. And again, we have a nice clean field here. So if we do spill something, uh, we just clean it up. So what I've done here is I've made a little funnel. It's just a piece of weighing paper that I've twisted. And I put a little piece of tape on it. This is just to widen this out, give us a little bit more area to put in our transfer from here. These weighing boats are nice because we can kind of bend them a little bit. And so we, we, can, we can get this to funnel right into here. And if I can do it without getting in the way, I, and we're just going to quantitatively transfer. Now remember, all of this should go in because this is our weight. We're going to leave a little bit behind. Now we say it's, it's kind of catching here. So I got to tap it down so it can come down in the funnel. As it's getting up there. We'll worry about that in a second. So I'm just making sure all the bulk of this is going down. Now this is a part two where you don't want to have stopcock grease already on here because if you do, you're going to get a bunch of powder stuck on that stopcock grease. Okay, so that went down. There's just this little residue back here. And remember, you know, we're just trying to get some clove oil out of a bunch of cloves. We're not worried about getting 100%, but just for pride, we want to see how much we can get. And you can compare your results to your fellow students if you were doing this live as kind of a competition. So I'm not going to get all of that. I'm not going to worry about it. It's really very little. Um, we could, in fact, go back and take another measurement of this and do it by mass difference from what we weighed over there and what we have left here. So we, we'll go ahead and do that just for fun, see if there's a really big difference. And we got all of this off our funnel. We got this. I'm going to tap that down. There's none stuck up in here where we're going to grease, so that's a good idea. We've got this. So what we're going to do is we're going to add some water to this. Um, this is, and again, it says to put in, this is 200 milligram, uh, milliliters. We don't have to be super precise about this. Um, hopefully I can do a quantitative transfer. Um, I'm not too worried about spilling some water here. If it were to spill. About half full. Oh, we we're going about half full. So again, yeah, whenever you're doing a flask, you should never fill it. Half full is about good, never more than two thirds full. And so that's about half full. This is a, a 
250 mil flask, so 150 mil. So if I have about 75 left, that's about 125. So now we've got this pre-warming already. I can feel a little heat coming off of it. So we're just gonna, while we set up our apparatus, we're gonna put that there just to get it starting to warm up because it's water and it takes a lot of energy to heat up water. So that's gonna take a little while. So we're gonna let that start heating up while we assemble our apparatus. And let's go take another final weight on this back over at the scale, oh, here it is. And, uh, and we can weigh by difference that way. So we can weigh it beforehand or afterwards. And I think afterwards, because we have a little residual here, we'll get a little more accurate weight. Yeah, and as much as this looks like on screen, it really isn't that much. But, you know, we might as well get an accurate reading on it. And we'll go ahead and throw this in. So this is really what you should be subtracting from that other measurement. So it's about 0.2, I believe, because we had uh, 5.4, whatever the reading was before. So let's use this for our mass difference there. Okay, when? 70, stop, 70, just put 70, Seven zero. okay? So use that for your mass difference, all right? From your book, uh, we have different various schematics, and this is typically the schematic that we see, and you see it all online. And here it is on here. Let's get it in there. That's what we're trying to set up. And I'm gonna do a little variation of this. So this has the water coming directly down in here, and then we're kind of distilling up in this kind of longer path here. So it's a really subtle difference between that setup and what I'm gonna actually do. So I'm going to reverse these two on this, this uh, piece of glass over there. So I'm going to have a more direct path here. We might have a problem with frothing over. That could be an issue. Um, but we want a shorter path length. So we talked about theoretical plates before. Um, and you want to increase uh, theoretical plates when you're trying to separate two different compounds. But we're not trying to separate two compounds. We want them to co-distill. So we want to reduce the number of theoretical plates, meaning we want to make it a, as quick as a, a shorter path to go from here to here, as opposed to what's showing in the book. Now, we're not sure if we're really going to get anything better. And we have nothing to compare it to today. But we're going to go ahead and try and avoid this longer path. And we're going to set it up with the water instead of drip, dripping straight down in, the water will have a longer path to get in and we'll have a shorter path here. So that's what we're gonna try and assemble here. So let's uh, get to work. So the first thing we need to do is secure our reaction flask. Now I have this in place here because whenever you're heating something, you wanna be able to remove the heat source at a moment's notice. If this starts to overheat, we need to remove the heat source and we want this to all be secured. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this up on the lab jack here. So once this is all settled, if I need to, I can lower the heating source from my reaction flask. So I've got this clamp here and we're gonna bring it down a little bit. And the other thing about these two is we can always just slide that lab jack out once, the assembly, once this is assembled. So I'm gonna use just a regular clamp. I'm gonna put it down here. Get it secured here. Now this is gonna move into place. Now it's good to just loosen all the joints here. This is the first joint that we wanna make sure is tight, right here. And make sure that's nice and secure. Make sure you choose a clamp that is gonna be very secure on here. There are clamps that you can kind of put on here, but they're not as snug and secure. So now I've got that secured, and now I can start tightening these up. And just like when you're doing your tires or something, you know, tighten them a little bit at a time, and now I'm set. So, if this starts to overheat, I can either lower the, I can do that to get the heat source away. And if you have like a block, sometimes you don't have a lab jack, these things are ridiculously expensive, by the way. But I can always, if this is overheating, these, this stays relatively cool. So I can grab this, I can pull that out, and I can lower it like that. And you see, if I've got this secured already, we don't have to worry about our apparatus going anywhere and we can remove the heat source, which we don't want to do right now. We want to get that heating. And we can see it's starting to warm up in there, which is a good thing. I see it's kind of sweating up here. So it is getting warmer. Now, we can put the rest of the glassware on. When we put glassware on, we want to use a minimal amount of 
um, grease. I've got the grease here in a um, syringe, which is nice, so we can just use little amounts. And usually you want to put them like 180 degrees from each other, from each side. And usually you want to grease the, the male portion, not the female portion. And I'm going to put it in here, and then I'm going to kind of move it around. And you can see the grease as this becomes more translucent from its opaque ground glass. And this, you'll see it, it gets nice and greased up. A minimal amount is what you want. I could use a little bit more so that it's nice and free flowing, it doesn't stick. You don't want to overdo it. And you want to keep the grease kind of more up at the top. You want to cover it all together if you're going to overdo it up at the top. Um, we're using water today, so we don't have to worry too much about the grease getting into the solvent because they're, the grease is non-polar and the water is polar. So it really doesn't dissolve it very well. Okay, so that's now secured. Now again, the, uh, the, the set funnel would normally be put over here, but I'm gonna put it over here. So again, grease it up. Now if you want, you could put some extra support on these. Um, we're gonna choose not to do that because we're gonna be, we're confident with this clamp here to hold everything in place. So we're gonna put that up here, that's nice and greased. Um, we're not really going to need a, um, a, a stopcock uh, on the top of this. We want it open whenever you're going to add water. So this we're going to continually add water to this um, so we could actually keep on distilling more than just that amount of water to get all of the clove oil we potentially could out of this apparatus. Okay, so now we have our other clamp here where we're going to put here so that we can angle down our... our uh, condenser and again now if you're putting these on lightly you can go ahead and fit them on but once we get this thing heated up we want to make sure the grease is on of course this is for a twofold so that these things seal well and so they don't freeze up because if you don't have this these things can stick together and uh, this class were actually it's pretty expensive so now you know we can go ahead and put our clips on here these these clips you know gravity is working for us here so we don't have to work here down here when you're putting on these clips you'll see that this is two pronged on one side and one pronged on the other side when you're putting on the clip put it on the one side with the, with the one prong on it so it's on the back side and it'll fit on nice and snugly uh, and I, I can feel this is this is tugging I've got a little bit of weight issue when we get this condenser on here it should even that out again we want to grease up the mail 180 degrees from each other and less is more because you can always add more later now this is going to be important that we put the cat clip on this because gravity is not working in our favor and so you can start seeing this become translucent so it's kind of translucent at the top not down at the bottom I want to have a complete coverage of it so I'll put a little bit of grease maybe a little bit lower and again, we're not worried about the water washing this out. So it's uh, with, with uh, organic solvents, you can see that. So you can see now that's nice and translucent. It's, it's flowing nice and smoothly. That's nicely done. We'll go ahead and clip that into place. Now remember these, these, these cl clips here that we're using, inspect them. This one's all kind of uh, getting a little bit melty, but it looks like it's in good enough c condition to go ahead and work here. We'll put that cat clip in. Okay, so that's nice and secured. And remember, when we get the water going in, this is the lower one. We're going to try and get this evened out. Okay, we want to try and make sure everything's plumb. And then we have this apparatus here, so that this is the vacuum adapter, so that we can have this keep our apparatus in here. And we're going to grease it up again. Now it's recommended before you start up anything, while you're new at this, to have somebody who's experienced come over here and check it. So I have Professor Ormord here to check my work. <laughs> so it's always good, you know, if you have extra eyes on it, you should uh, use those extra eyes and say, everything look good over here. Um, you know, once you start, if you've done umpteen, of the, now see, I put this, this clamp on and it's really loose. So I'm gonna get that one and throw it off to the side and get another one that um, is a little tighter fitting because these things do uh, get a lot of abuse. They warm up a lot and melt. And so this is just, it's a loose fitting there. Okay, 
This here, if it gets a little loose, it's not too bad because we're going to be dripping down here. We're going to collect over here, and what we're going to do, we can. This is just another lab jack here. I'm going to put below it to kind of support it, and we're going to go into a graduated cylinder. So the oil that we're collecting is pretty non-volatile, so we don't have to worry about icing this down in our collection flask or making sure that it's uh, not going to. Uh, evaporate away. If a little water evaporates away, that's fine. We're going to have plenty of water. So now the last thing we need to do is we need to get our thermometer in place. Now, again, with thermometers, as you're putting these together, oh, we'll go back over here. Okay. Be careful with these because, you know, if these things break off, these, these things can go through people's hands and whatnot. So it's recommended to get a little bit of grease on this thing to make sure that it's, you can use grease, you can use oil, some sort of lubricant there. Um, so that that goes in nice and smoothly. All right, and we want to be able to read it. What are we expecting this to boil? It's water, so we want to make sure we can see the 100 degrees, but now it's also the placement of this. Again, we're going to put a little bit of grease on here. Put it down. Now I was, okay, and see there's just enough room for this to fit, so that's grand. Okay. So in the, nor in the setup in your, in your lab book, this and this are reversed. This piece and this person. And it probably won't make a much of a difference. It'll be fun when we get people back into the labs. We can have half the group do it one way, half the group do it the other way, and when, then we can uh, compare results. So let's go ahead, just for completeness, let's go ahead and put some clamps on here. Every, every joint, give it a little pet clamp. Okay. So that's all set up. We have a removable heat source. You can start to see this thing sweating. It's starting to heat up. We've got our Variac set at about 30%, which is pretty good. And we've got a little bit of frothing going on here. Um, it's not necessary to put in um, uh, boiling chips here because the solid that we have in here from the clove, ground cloves should be enough to prevent boiling. Um, if we want, we could go ahead and add a couple, um, but it's probably not necessary. If we get a lot of frothing, uh, we might consider it. Um, and again, if we see this thing boiling up, we see the frothing coming up, I can always lower this heat source a little bit, which will reduce that frothing. So is it necessary to be water jacketed cooling here, or is it going to just... Okay, so we want to get some clamp, some hoses out here. I got some in my drawer. Okay, okay, here's a couple ones, okay. So now I, I do this with my, so let's go ahead and get the water going now. So this is gonna be my input in the lower one. This will be my output, so let's get the input. Now we don't wanna put it on the gas, we don't wanna put it on the vacuum, we don't wanna put it on the air, we wanna put it on the cold water setting, which is here. Make sure these are on nice and tightly. This is going to be the out, so it always goes in the lower one, out the upper one. Make sure these are on well. Now, if you're gonna set something up to go overnight, it's recommended to secure these with maybe some wire or something. We're gonna be watching this. Now, I do this with my, this hose here, this is the outlet. We'll go ahead and start this flow because we're seeing um, some condensation creeping up there. Now, you see how it's starting to froth down below? Now, when you're putting on the water, Less is more. You want as a little bit of flow. Checking your flow over here. On this, what I'll do usually is I'll weight this down with something. I usually use a clamp here. And I'll weight it down so that it'll help secure it. That, that's just a little bit of weight to keep it where you want it. Okay, so I think we're pretty much set up to go. We see the frothing. We can start seeing the beads of sweat. i got to check your work first. Okay, he's going to check it make sure... Everything's good to go and secure. So, um, if, so this is just set at 30 for our Variac here. So that's pretty, you know, 30% power. Um, we haven't seen anything coming over yet. And we can go ahead and we can fill up this flask here. I've got some water. We, we'll have it closed off right now. Um, so I'm just filling up. We don't need to put a stopcock on the top of my SEP funnel. So we're just going to go ahead and 
add in that remaining water. So as this becomes, gets stilled over, we can keep on adding water, keep on collecting. So I got approval? Yes. Thank you. Right. Not my first rodeo, you know. <laughs> I think I'm gonna set this up here so it captures the volume too. So they can see it sort of. And so, you know, we're teaching you this technique as an organic technique, but you know, people in biology end up doing this um, for all sorts of reasons. I, when I was in grad school, I had a guy who was working on nuclear magnetic resonance. He was an analytical chemist, but he had to extract some sort of enzyme or something he was looking at out of cow liver, I think it was. So he was like doing all sorts of extractions and all these organic chemical techniques to get his molecule of interest. 40. 40, okay. So we're gonna bump it up a little bit. And as we bump it up, if we, if we do bump it up a little bit too much, we can always just lower that heating mantle just a little bit if we feel it's, get, it's getting out of control. Now another trick we can do is some tin foil. So why don't we go ahead and play with that a little bit just so you can get a demonstration. So, okay, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of tin foil here. Buy it at the supermarket. So aluminum or ten? It's aluminum foil. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> that's that's so old school, isn't it? Yeah. Like a tin can. <laughs> okay. This is true. This is aluminum. Okay. So I'm gonna just put a little bit of this here to keep it kind of warm. We want to make sure that we're we're still able to see what's going on here, and we're not we're still not collecting yet. So. We're getting up, I've got on my thermometer 95 degrees, so it wants to start to go over here. I can see the sweat coming up here. And you know, with the aluminum foil, we can always give it a little check. And if we want, we can, we can do this. This will also speed up the process too, um, by retaining that heat up in the column. And also we're talking about reducing the number of theoretical plates. So if we're able to heat this glassware up, it's not doing that condensing uh, and re vaporizing cycles, if we keep this glassware warm, we'll reduce the number of theoretical plates because, again, we don't want to separate the water from the oil. We want them to co-distill. So we're still waiting for a drop to come out over here. Now, it's always a good idea, these um, faucets here, um, they can slow down, speed up sometimes, so it's just keep on checking your water flow. And you want just you want a, a fair trickle. You don't want to have it blasting, so you can. I don't know if you can see that, but we're having a fair trickle. Keep it there. Can you see it? Okay. Okay. So that's looking good. It's weighted down. So now it's just a waiting game, uh, and hopefully we we did bump up the heat a little bit. We can check to see if it's frothing. You can see it better than I can. It looks okay. And I can see a little bit of condensation up here. Um, we're up to about 97, 98 degrees. I don't know if you can actually see that if I go it that way. Um, oh, we gotta adjust the camera and you might have to zoom in on that, but you can trust me too. I'll have a look at it. And now I can see some I can see some coming over here now. And okay, so we're at a we're at a good point right now. And this variac, remember when you change that setting on the variac, it's not an instantaneous change. It takes a little while for this electric uh, mantle to heat up and then transfer it to the water and see the result over here. First drop. So, so okay, we got a drop. There you go. Okay. And if you look at these drops, if you if you can, if you were here, you'd see that they're kind of cloudy. They're not, it doesn't look like, you know, real pure water, which is a good sign. That means that the oil and water are co-distilling over. So that would be a note you'd put into your uh, lab book eventually saying, oh, the water's a little cloudy. And you could surmise why, because it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of oil, a clove oil in the water. So we're getting now a good drip over. So really, you know, you, you don't want this coming over in buckets. If you can get, you know, like a drip, 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 
drip was a good probably you know estimation of what you want to see. So it's still pretty slow coming over. So we're going to shut this down now, so we're going to remove the heat. We're going to turn off the heating mantle. Now if you look over here, we saw, see all this frothing that came up? We came over right up to here. None of it came over, which is good. We came over here. Now our water is all cloudy. Is that a problem? No, actually that's a good sign. If it was just pure water coming over, that means we would, hadn't gotten much essential oils. So all that cloudiness is showing us that we have got some eugenol in here. And actually, it's, 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 technically it's clove oil because it's about 85% eugenol and then it's got other compounds in it. Um, it's coming from cloves, so they're all naturally occurring compounds. Nothing we should be too particularly scared of. Um, nothing that doesn't show up in a typical holiday ham, right? So I'm going to put this, we can, put, we can aim this up here. And because we have our apparatus secured here, Everything's safe. We'll just let that cool down before we get to cleaning it up. And here is our product. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I, I've got an injury here. Um, so I'm going to let my lab partner do the, ex the extraction today. Um, and it will put you in the very capable hands of Professor Ormord. And I'll be standing by to assist. And uh, so we'll be tag taming this experiment as we move forward. So we're going to move on to the extraction phase. All right, we're ready to do the next part of the experiment. We have our distillate here. Remember, this is water and eugenol, or clove oil more specifically. And we are going to uh, extract the organic with dichloromethane. Uh, this is really similar to doing the N compound, the neutral compound from the acid base extraction lab. Uh, the main difference here is our organic solvent is going to be on the bottom this time. So I'm going to go ahead and add my extract to the set funnel. Wait, hold on, hold on, wait. Make sure this is nice and secure. Okay. I did. You got it. It's okay. Good. First thing I did. Yeah, absolutely. Well, your experience, uh, you know. I was just going to point that out for. All right. <laughs> Gosh, get my muy importante. And I'm going to mention this too now. When you clean these up and you're going to store this, you should loosen it up because when these are tight, they can warp and then stop working. So make sure when you store this in <coughs> your lab kit, when you're all done, that you loosen that up. Uh, when, here I'm going to extract with 20 mils of dichloromethane, but remember you want to do it in two parts, not just all at once. You get better extraction this way. So I'm going to add about half of this. It doesn't need to be exact, just about half. And then I will shake it up and extract the organic layer, which should be the bottom one. What do you think is going to happen with the water layer? What's going to happen to it? You see that? Vent. See, if you don't vent, the thing will vent for you. <laughs> when you turn it over, make sure you hit that stop cut. Yep. Now, what's so, going on with that water layer? Is it still, it's still cloudy. It's, it's, it stays cloudy, it seems like. Yeah, okay. There might be other impurities, too, that aren't going to come out. Which layer is which again? Bottom layer is organic. How do we know that? Because dichloromethane is more dense than water. Generally with halogens, that's the case. Halogenated solvents are usually more dense than water. And for us here, it's convenient because that's the part we want. So we don't have to take out the water first. All right, remember, just like before, you want to leave a little bit behind of the layer you're extracting because you don't want to get any of the top layer if possible. See, that's what you don't want to do. 
Uh -oh. It is okay. That's what we're going to be using the uh, drying agent for later on. So this is okay. We'll take care of it later. And if you really mess up, you can just pour it all back in and just do it again. You could, but I'm not worried about it today. No. All right. Go ahead and layer separate again. We're going to combine both organic extracts into one and then dry it with magnesium sulfate. Epsom salt. Actually, Epsom salt's the hydrate. It is, but yeah, close enough. <laughs> because it's uh, you're going to put it into the water, and it's, it's the anhydrous is typically more expensive. Yeah, it looks like it didn't clear up at all. It's okay. All right, push this in the back. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and add some of the magnesium sulfate, MgSO4, anhydrous. Remember, it has to be the anhydrous version, otherwise it doesn't work as a drying agent. And we, we like to use magnesium sulfate because we get 12 moles of water to one mole of magnesium sulfate. So yes, sodium sulfate can be used. Um, it's less expensive, um, but it usually takes longer. So this is quicker. We're not paying for it. Well, you've already paid for it actually through your lab fees. Remember it clumps at first, and then we're looking for a free flowing powder. When I swirl it, it's free flowing, not all clumped in the bottom. I have a sufficient amount. So it's gotta look like a Christmas, Christmas snow globe, or holiday snow globe would be quick, be correct. Okay, and then I like to cover it with a watch glass while it sits for a few minutes. Okay, we're gonna let, the, let that sit for five minutes. We will come back to it. Uh, it's now been on here for about five minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and decant it off. And but first things first, I, got, I obtained a tear weight on the final collection beaker. So make sure you get this tear weight. 93.8717 grams. Uh, that is including the, the weight of the tape as well. Not uh, the ink though. The weight of the ink is negligible. <laughs> Just don't worry about it. I'd agree. Okay, so here you, uh, you definitely need to be careful here that you don't get any of the solid. So you definitely don't want to have it to be disturbed when you're uh, pouring it. So carefully. So if you have an old bottle of wine and you get sediment at the bottom of the wine, this is the technique for getting the sediment off the wine. You decant the wine into a decanter. And that also lets the wine breathe, which we're going to breathe this by evaporating it. A decantation is not the best method. It's better to actually filter it, but this is a nice crude way to get your liquid but, out. But when you filter it, you're still going to lose some product potentially in the filter paper and whatnot. So this is not a bad way to do it. And if you really want to do it, you could add some more methylene chloride and get off more. We're not totally worried about getting a, a huge yield off of this because we're not a commercial process where we're trying to make some money. <laughs> so we're not trying to maximize our yield necessarily. Okay, for the next part here, I'm just gonna go ahead and put it on the hot plate. Which is already preheated. Yep, I already started it heating. Hopefully it's not too hot. I think it's actually a little too hot. Let me turn it down. And hopefully I don't start a fire today. You guys are actually hoping I start a fire today. I know how you guys are. It'll be exciting. It's more exciting that way. So this thing is set at 255 degrees Celsius. So it's well above boiling. So you see it's it's taken off real fast because the boiling point of methylene chloride is actually pretty low. What is it, like 45, yeah. 50? You should know. You should have looked this up and put it in your notebook, right? The boiling point of methylene chloride. So I have the hot plate a little too hot, so I'm, make, I'm just having you know extra control on it. I'm going to monitor it the whole way pretty much because I don't want it to boil over. Because uh, we're expecting very little today, and if it, this boils over at all, we're going to lose everything. Now we chose methylene chloride for because of its convenience. Now if you were going to use this essential oil on your body or your 
lips or something like that, your gums, there's lots of medicinal uses for this in addition to its use as just a fragrance. Um, methylene chloride may not be the best choice because it will have some residual around. Do you want to grab a hose a piece of the airline? Of course it's not going to be absorbed there. Yeah. No air compressor today. Yeah, it doesn't take much much to get this stuff to dissolve. You gotta be patient. Which I'm not being right now. So typically what I do here, you just let it boil or heat until you have an oil left behind that's no longer bubbling. That means you have most of the dichloromethane removed. But as uh, Dr. Reynolds said, there is going to be some residual amounts. This is definitely not uh, safe to use on your skin or your gums or anything like that. But you could use other solvents that would be safer. This one's nice because it, 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 it vaporizes off fairly well. Yeah, it looks like it's about done, so I just like to give it some extra time just to make sure we get as much of the solvent off as possible. And then we have to let it cool down before we get a mass on it. And then we will have fairly pure eugenol. I'm oh, sorry, clove oil. Clove, clove oil. oil. Yeah. Mostly eugenol. Okay, so after all this, we've got our final product here. Now, normally you may not always smell your products or taste them. In the old literature, they always had the smell and they had the taste. It was typically bitter. I'm not going to taste this, but it, it smells like, to me, Christmas, you know, if you have a Christmas ham, whatever. So we have our clove oil here. There's actually a fair amount of it. Take a look. So we're going to, you know, let's get a nice, you can see here, we'll do it that way, the top. Looks about as expected. So that's why this is so expensive. We had 10 grams, all that big pile of clothes, and that's what we got out of it. So, you know, next time you go down there, I have a friend who actually sells these kinds of uh, things. So this was zeroed out. So this weight, I take it, had it with the, there's a significant amount there. Remember to get the mass from, by difference. The weight on the scale is the mass of the of the clove oil and the beaker with watch glass. And tape. And tape. <laughs> and ink. <laughs> All right. Okay, Alrighty. so now we're going to take this and we're going to perform a couple chemical tests to show what kind of functional groups are in this, or give some evidence that these functional groups are in there. So let's proceed over it and we'll do our chemical tests. Okay, we're about ready to go ahead and do the chemical tests. We're going to start off by doing the bromine test first. So in the first test tube here, I'm going to go ahead and put some cyclohexane. Which is hexanes in everything. Hexanes, but uh, seeing at the, as these are just alkanes, we should not have uh, any double bond. It should be negative to the bromine test. And remember from Dr. Reynolds' lecture from earlier that we should see a negative result, meaning color stays. So here's our, cy our cyclohexane. I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of drops. And this will give us an idea of what that color is going to yep. look like. Color stays. It's like a reddish orange color. Because this is just no double bonds in there to react with it. So cyclohexane negative to bromine. Okay, so the next one here, we're going to go ahead and put cyclohexene. Into the cyclohexane. So put, let's, let's put the cyclohexane first in. Let's get our solvent in. All right, so this is the cyclohexane. We're going to make a solution with cyclohexane, a little bit of cyclohexane. Here's our solvent. There's our substrate. Now this has got the double bond in it. So it's a six-membered ring with one double bond, cyclohexene. This should be positive, meaning the color goes away. So let's see if we can get a nice view of this. You guys see the color come down the side and it instantly goes away as soon as it touches the solution. Now if we keep adding it, we can use up all the cyclohexene until the color persists. Here we 
That might take a while. We'll find out. But that's a significant amount. And remember, this is what it looked like before when it wasn't reacted. So, hey, I got an idea. Let's pour that into here. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So there's bromine, well, there's bromine in there. If we take that, which has cyclic, what's going to happen? Can we predict? It's going to have that orange color. Do you guys see works. that? It lightened up. It went away. That's the cyclohexene. We're acting with that bromine. Okay. So for the uh, now we have to test it with the eugenol that we collected earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and add in our solvent, which is cyclohexane. So this has no double bond in it. We're just using it as a solvent. Let's get a couple squirts in there. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and add a few drops of the clove oil that we freshly extracted. So we see a little bit of yellowing, and that's just from the compound. The clove oil has a little yellow tint to it. Okay, so what's our prediction? What's gonna happen? Hmm, color's gonna persist. Let's or see what happens. See it dripping down the side there. Color does not persist. Now at some point we can add enough and we react it all and it'll persist. But it's pretty much disappearing. Yep. So that is a positive for eugenol with the bromine test. Reacting with that double bond in the eugenol. Okay, we are now set up to do the iron test. Uh, what we have here is we have some of our Recovered eugenol, uh, two four pentane dione, and then we have some phenol. And to each of these, I'm going to add a little bit of cyclohexane solvent, just to get it moving around a little bit. So that was to the eugenol. Uh, the middle one is the two two four pentane dione, and then the last one is phenol. Is a solid? Do you want to add your comment about phenol? Yeah, so phenol is actually the active ingredient in chloroseptic, that the, the spray for your, the back of your throat. So it's an analgesic, it'll relieve that. But if you look up the MSDS for this thing, phenol here, it's, it's pretty brutal. So my recommendation is don't use chloroseptic because it's kind of toxic, unless you really, really have a bad sore throat, in which case I would recommend going to the doctor. <laughs> and uh, here we have some of the iron chloride. Uh, we're just going to use it as a comparison for the color change. So this is what it looks like before we react. This is the iron three chloride solution. And I'm going to pull from the reagent bottle here for each of the tests and hold them side by side. So let's go ahead and do the phenol first. So here I have phenol. Let's go ahead and add a few drops of the iron three chloride. What, what do we expect to see, by the way, folks? Remember from the pre-lab, what are we seeing? You guys, oh, lots. There it is, it's on the bottom layer. You guys see that? Which layer is that, the aqueous layer or the? Aqueous. It's the aqueous layer. Oh yeah. So blue and purple are very unique colors to find in organic chemistry. Yeah, so that, that appears to be a purple color to me. It looks purple. Uh, do we have paper towel? Get, so this is a good technique to use so you can really get a good background on there. It's a real bluish purple. No, it's purple. It's very purpley. Yeah, you get a good view on that. All right. All right. And, that's in the, and that's in the water layers where that complex ends up. Okay, uh, the next one here is the 2,4 pentane dione. And just like before, we're gonna add a, a few drops of the iron three chloride. Make sure to get it all in frame this time. So this again, this is an aqueous solution that we're adding to uh, an organic solution. So we end up getting the color in the bottom layer. It's in the top layer a little bit too for this one. 2,4 pentane diol, what it is, it has an acidic proton on it between the two carbonyl groups. 
Yeah, the iron uh, test is specifically for enols and phenols. And we'll cover those in detail next semester, but all you need to know now is they are a double bond that has an OH directly attached. We cover that the chemistry of those in, in next semester. And our videographer, <laughs> Professor Ormord, he, he'll he'll add in these structures. So, yes, I will. You will. All right. The last part here is uh, we're testing it with the recovered eugenol. Let's see what we see. What do we expect to see? We're seeing anything? It's just it's it's, it's uh, yellow down there. I'm not seeing a. Complex. Uh, slightly yellow. Any more than usual, I don't think. It looks like it's negative. This is odd. I've had this in the, in the past. I have not had a positive check test. For yeah, so uh, this test should have been positive. And what I want you guys to do is be honest. So even though it was supposed to be positive, we're seeing here that it was actually negative. So be honest with your reports, put negative for your result. But I want you guys to know that it should have been positive. I'm not sure why it's showing up negative here. And I'd blame it on the experimenter. Okay. <laughs> and let's go ahead and uh, grab them all again. Now remember this iron test is for phenols in general. There might be some property to this particular phenol that doesn't allow this. Um, the fact that it's uh, the phenol is, has a, 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 the ether substituent right next to it might be blocking it from being able to complex with uh, the iron. So there might be some reasons why that was didn't give a positive test for phenol. Okay. <clears throat> Steric hindrance, we'll call it. Yes. All right, that is it. Have fun uh, doing your lab reports, everybody. I'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.